Hello everyone, uh, thanks for coming and uh, hopefully you guys have a great break. And it's my great honor and pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Wei Peng from Princeton University. Uh, Dr. Peng is currently a system professor of public and international affairs and the Adlinger Center for Energy and the Environment. And her research uses computational models to quantify difficult trade-offs of climate policy across social, political, and environmental aspects. Uh, Peng uh, has you know, published many papers in Nature, Nature, Climate Change, Nature Sustainability, and many others. She's also the co-author of the recently published the fifth national climate assessment. And Peng gets her PhD from Princeton as well. So uh, it's a great pleasure to invite her the floor is Thanks to meet you all. And it's wonderful to be here. So as you can tell from the introduction at the title of my talk, I'll be talking a lot about modeling in the next 15 minutes or so. But before I talk about the models, I want to start with something more personal. Since I grew up in China, and I guess some of you did probably as well, I want to start with this question, which is, what was China like 40 years ago? Most of you probably don't remember, me neither. I wasn't even born. Ah, that's something I do remember. I grew up in a city called Changsha in southern China. And about 20 years ago, we got our first international terminal so that people in my province can travel internationally. About 10 years ago, we got our first train station for high-speed trains. And about five years ago, we got our first metro line running in the city. Now we have five of them. And Changsha is only a second-tier city in China. If you're looking at the larger city, that was Shanghai in the 1980s and Shanghai today. So you can see that the past 30 or 40 years has been really transformational for China. And this is really the story behind it. This is really the background for any story we tell about China, not with growing case. So arguably China is the world's worst polluter. Now we get some competitors like India, but China has been a global top carbon emitter for a long time. Air pollution has been very severe with a lot of health damages. So really looking behind this economic miracle on the one hand, and also the growing thing on the other hand, really the energy that is back for us driving all of this. So looking at how the emissions has been going up over the past 40, 30 years, you could also see that the energy consumption is on the one hand driving the economic miracle, on the other hand, leading to a lot of environmental problems. The past is in the past. What we need to think more about is the future. So what would China be like 40 years from now? For this question, I'm sure nobody knows, but we do know the direction because the country has pledged to reach carbon neutrality by 2060. Looking at how the emissions has been going up in the past four decades, the country will need to completely reverse that trajectory in the next 40 years. And in fact, China is not the only country in this race to net zero. United States and EU both has pledged to reach uh, net zero emissions by 2050. India pledged to reach net zero by 2070. And we also have more than 100 countries are now either have pledged or are considering a net zero target around the, the mid-century. So I'm sure this is the question you have in mind. Can we get there? Unfortunately, I don't have the superpower to predict the future. So as a modeler, this is a question that we're more capable of answering. How can we get there? So this is why energy models have been used widely to understand how, uh, if we just go for the existing policies, are we on track to bend the curve? And clearly we're not. So models have been also been useful to really thinking about what are the additional effort that would be needed if we really wanna achieve climate decarbonization. But looking at this figure, I'm sure you're not not very like unfamiliar with this figure. For some reason, this part you cannot see it, but this is from the IPCC report. Um, looking at this, what is the problem? In my view, the problem here is that all of these models are so heavily centered around technology. So if you're really looking at the model, it's all about technologies competing with each other. We don't have any human face. We don't have any like company faith in the model. And that leads to results like this. Here is one representative scenario from the IPCC report, how we can get to the 1.5 degree. 
So you can see that the model tells us that we need to quickly phase down, even phase out fossil fuel, and at the same time, quickly scale up our renewables. So once we start to move away, thinking about just the technology, to really thinking about what does it mean for human? And, what, and once we start thinking about those human-centered transition, there will be new set of questions to occur. First of all, given how dependent we are on fossil fuel today, can we really face down fossil fuel that quickly? And given all the infrastructure and behavioral inertia around new technology, can we really scale up renewable that quickly? On top of that, if you imagine that net zero world, where we're not going to use fossil fuel anymore, that's going to fundamentally change the way we use energy, the way we drive, the way we get heating and cooking, and also to many people, the jobs and livelihood. So then the question becomes, what does it mean to people, real people like us, who are, go who are going to experience this net zero transition together with the technologies? And in fact, once you started thinking about the human impact, you find that energy is really at the center of sustainability. So energy is the way we use energy is not only the major cause of why we have so many greenhouse gases and having this climate problem, it's also the fundamental cause for the air pollution problems and also a lot of related health damages. And there's equity implications embedded in the way we use energy. On top of that, Climate change is a long-term issue, whereas a lot of the other issues are near-term. And to most people, worries about global warming is still less pressing than worries about their health and the health of the family. So then the question becomes, can we incorporate, and also how can we incorporate air quality and health considerations into our energy strategy targeting net zero? And this is really the overarching research question for a lot of work in my research group and also going to be the overarching research question for my talk today. So over the past few years, I'm leading this project called the Health Effects of Deep Decarbonization, where we really put together an interdisciplinary team of energy system modelers, air quality modelers, um, epidemiologists, and also decision scientists and putting together a, a, a role of discipline, trying to understand what are the driving factors to determine the future health and air quality impact from, from energy transition. Oh, you can see this, but we're going to, let me see if I can click that. Not really, anyways. Um, this is our new project website because I recently moved from Penn State to Princeton University. Our new project was, website will be launched um, sometime soon. Thank you. Okay, so very briefly, what are the fundamental methodological advancement our group would like to tackle? So we really focus on energy decarbonization, but we really try hard to couple two kind of analytical frameworks. One is energy modeling. Like if we really remember the figure I showed you earlier, if we really want to get net zero, what kind of energy transformation and the required technology of deployment would be needed? with impact assessment, where I think the real expert is actually in the, in the room today. With that, I wanna talk briefly about what is energy modeling. And because if you're really thinking about energy modeling, it's a very broad umbrella term where you describe different computational models to understand system transition in the energy space. And a lot of our work is focusing on one type of particular energy modeling tools, which is called the integrated assessment models. In case you're not familiar with this kind of model, I have one slide to quickly give you a high-level overview of what this model is all about. So this kind of models usually start with exogenous assumptions about GDP, population, policy targets, other technology and socioeconomic assumptions, et cetera. And then all of those exogenous assumptions are going to go into a core model where a system of systems are going to be modeled. So for example, um, in order to fuel the future economic growth, we need to think about how much energy demand will be needed. And in order to meet the energy demand, we need to think about what kind of technology portfolio that will be deployed to meet that demand. And because the way we uh, have our energy demand and meet our energy demand using supply, that will have implications on not only the CO2 emission, determining the climate future, but also the land requirement, et cetera. 
So you can see that here I use a lot of two-way arrows because that's really what the integrated model hope to capture. Um, just take one as an example, energy and climate. So the way we use energy will largely change the CO2 emissions as a, and as a result of the climate future. But on the other hand, if we end up having a warmer future, then this is going to increase our uh, cooling demand during the summertime and decreasing our heating demand during the wintertime. And that will also link back from climate to our energy use. So in short, the core model over there is really trying to capture that dynamics and interactions across different systems so that we can have a holistic understanding of the system interactions. Coming out of the model, the output usually include economic costs, energy pathways, emissions associated with that, land use requirement, et cetera. So this is a quick overview of what is IAM, integrated assessment model. And because I'm giving this talk at Yale, I think this slide is very important. So take any component as an example, just energy. There are actually two ways you can characterize the system. The first way is that I can use a very highly stylized representation using one equation as an example to characterize at a stylized level, if we change the, um, the, the demand, how the energy system will respond and what are the implications on emissions. And in fact, um, the DICE model developed by Bill Nordhaus here on this campus is in that category. It's what we call highly stylized IM or benefit cost IM. That is not the type of model I'll be talking about today. The type of model I'll be talking about today is what we call the detailed process IM, where the goal here is really to have a fine grain representation of the whole technology system. So for example, how the primary energy is going to go through this complex processing and conversion of energy carriers as a result meeting our end use demand. So in the detailed process IM that I will show some results later, what we really hope to capture is to, is to capture those physical flows in order to meet the energy supply and demand. And also in each of this process, you can have many different technologies, wind, solar, coal, and the type of coal power plants all competing to meet the demand. So it is those fine grain representation of the technology system that really makes this useful and important um, and possible actually to capture the downstream air quality and health implications. Okay, are we all clear on IAM? Okay. So I wanna just talk briefly using two slides about what I see as the key challenges to couple IAM with air quality and health impact assessment. So first of all, one key challenge is that IMs are generally too coarse and don't have the right variables. So um, if you're thinking about what IMs can really get out from the model, by the way, in case I didn't mention that, IMs are used widely in the IPCC report and also in the National Climate Assessment that I was contributing to. So this is really kind of like the underlying model that have been driving a lot of like, technology debate, even policy debate around decarbonization. So it is a powerful tool on the one hand, but on the other hand, we also need to be very careful about what it can do and cannot do. So that's really what I hope to achieve here, which is this is the direct output from the IAM, but this is really the type of measures we need to have once we start thinking about the human impact, okay? From the IAM, we usually only have the global mean temperature, but what we really care about is local meteorology and climate damages and also fine scale representation of heat exposure and exposure to natural disasters. IAM doesn't have that. The second thing, a second example here is that IAM usually give you regional air pollution emissions, but if you're really thinking about what we care about at the end of the day is local pollution exposure and health impact. It doesn't have that either. Here's one last example. Um, IAMs usually can tell you the regional mitigation costs, like technology, system, deployment costs, in order to achieve certain mitigation goals. But ultimately, nobody really cares about the aggregate costs. It's really about the winners and losers and the distribution of the costs that matter in terms of to shape the policy feasibility and the implementation outcomes. So to me, that's the first challenge we face, where we have a set of very cool tools being used by the international and national decision maker, but at the same time, there's a gap between what the models can tell and what we really care about 
at a living human being. Here's another challenge in my view, which is there's, there's very complex relationships between actions and impact. So we know that if you're really thinking about global climate, it ultimately responds to cumulative emissions. As a result, it is determined by the aggregate actions at local, state, and national scale. But on the other hand, on the other hand if you're thinking about the local impact, for example, the pollution impact we have here in New Haven is not only determined by what New Haven is doing to eliminate emissions, it also has something to do with what Connecticut is doing as a whole and how the Northeastern region are doing to reduce emissions because ultimately air pollution is a regional problem because of the wind transport. On top of that, the global climate would also matter because if we end up having a different climate future, that would really influence the future temperature pattern, uh, precipitation pattern, wind pattern, et cetera. Those are the critical determinants, physical determinants of the future pollution level. So in other words, our local impacts are also affected by this multi-level decisions. So once you have this like high level diagram in, in mind, you already realize that, hey, there's a complex mismatch or match between the actions and the impact. And to make it worse, a lot of the problem we face in this, in this space is that we need to make decisions today knowing that the impact will last for decades. And that's, be that's because energy infrastructure on the one hand has very long time. So we have to think about once you put down a power plant, what will happen in the next 30 years? And on the other hand, we will also see co-evolution of the social demographic system like migration, like urbanization, all those future uncertainty in the technology, in the energy and the social economic space will collectively make this picture even more complex. So in other words, this is another challenge in my view to, to really thinking about the impact from decarbonization that we really need to improve our understanding and the capability of characterizing that complexity of the cause effect chain. So I hope by now you're convinced that this is a difficult problem, so we need to spend time on it. What I want to do today is to quickly go through three examples where we try to improve our modeling capability to answer those decision-relevant questions. The first example I'm going to give is around the effects of global mitigation on regional air quality and health. Then we want to build on that first project, start to thinking about uncertain, future uncertainty, so we can identify under what conditions we're going to see more robust air quality effects, uh, comparing with like some of the conditions where we may see more divergence results. And finally, we don't only care about global climate mitigation, we also care about that interaction between global and regional action. So the third example is about the effects of domestic and global decarbonization on exposure disparities across the US. Um, so this will allow us to start thinking about some of the distributional consequences and the equitable policies, I think. Let me pause and add any questions so far about those like overview I was providing just now. Okay, so now I wanna to go, to go through each example uh, fairly quickly. So the first example is about the effects of global climate mitigation on regional air quality and health. Remember I mentioned just now what IAM can do and cannot do. What I highlight in gray here are what the IAMs can do. So these models already take, yes, already take climate, what are the climate mitigation efforts you wanna achieve? what are the underlying socioeconomic evolutions, and use that to drive uh, what will be the resulting uh, energy and land use, and also the emissions of, emissions of CO2 and air pollutants. But really, ultimately, we care much more about the human health. As a result, we need to fill out this graph part I highlight here, how would that emissions influence pollution exposure, and also how would the socioeconomic factors shape and influence the future population vulnerability as a result of changing the health outcomes. Oh, this work is led by my PhD student Hui Yang and her paper published earlier this year on nature sustainability. Okay, how did we do that? So this is the key model method we have here is to do model coupling and also downscaling. What I highlight here is really traditionally what I am modeling have been doing. 
So we have been using a global IM to develop five future scenarios, um, and they vary in two dimensions. One is the socioeconomic trends, as well as the stringency of air pollution policy. Those are uh, determined by the sh shared socioeconomic pathways, SSPs. And also the other dimension that we vary is the climate targets. And these are different uh, representative concentration pathways uh, ranging from 1.9, roughly 1.5 degree by the end of the century to RCP 8.5 um, watt per square meter. That's roughly like five-ish degree warming by the end of the century. So and re that's where the IMs can do. And this is what we really care about, about the health outcome. Let's just do premature deaths for now. So a lot of stuff we do is in the middle. And let me break them down one by one. So first of all, we get the, um, using the IM, we then downscale the emissions of CO2 and air pollutant emissions and put them into an earth system model. Here we use the GFDL ESM4 model where we can round the atmospheric system at 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer resolution. So from that, we get both the climate variables, which is the future changing temperature, precipitation, et cetera. Those are important because they're going to drive your pollution level. And also the, the, the ambient PM2.5 concentration that responds to that emissions and responds to that climate future. And this is the proxy we use to measure um, exposure. And then it is not, if you're really thinking about health, it's not only about the average exposure level, it's also about your population size, about your vulnerability, such as aging, and also what is your baseline mortality rate? That's another vulnerability. So we also leverage the community efforts to downscale the future population projection to one, one over eight um, degree resolution across the world, and, for, and, and also for the aging pattern um, at that resolution. And for the uh, base and mortality rate, we use a development forecast model called the International Futures, where they, use, they establish the empirical relationship using the historical data, like how your income and education level uh, predict your base and mortality rate, and use that to project for the future base and mortality rate. So, uh, and this is based on the country level. Everything else is finer scale. So through this model coupling and downscaling efforts, we can now really get from that high level IM results to exposure, population size, and population vulnerability. Okay, what do we claim? So I want to highlight two findings from this example. The first is that we did find that with climate mitigation, pollution exposure is likely to go down in most regions. For example, this is roughly the two degree scenario. And what you're going to see is that by the end of the century, relative to today, you see most places in purple. That means that the pollution level by the end of the century will be much lower, largely because we move away from fossil fuel. But at the same time, we, do, we still see health burden may go up in some regions, as we highlight in red here and there. And that is because it's not only about exposure, it also has to, to do with how many people are exposed to that pollution and how vulnerable you are. So when we're looking at this results, we were thinking, huh, maybe it's because those places have more people living in that country in the future. And that drives us to do the decomposition analysis, really figuring out what, what is the most important social demographic factors shaping that result. We actually find that it is the population aging and the declining base and mortality rate that, is, that can potentially play a more important role than population growth or the exposure changes. So this is just one example of the result. Same scenario, two degree scenario, and the bar here shows you the contribution of each factor to that cumulative, to that 2015 to 2100 change in the PM 2.5 attributable depth. So for example, what people usually focus on in my field is about the change in PM 2.5 concentration. So you can see that they're negative, meaning that holding everything constant, yes, you, you reduce your pollution level, you bring down the premature death. But if you look through this example country regions, uh, Africa, India, USA, you can see that it's really the, the orange and the blue bar that's driving main, main results. And that's essentially, this, this orange bar here is population aging. So essentially, this is to say holding everything else at the today's level because of the potential aging that will happen in India they might be 1,000%, like 10 times higher than by the end of the century comparing with today. 
luckily, a lot of those effects will be controlled, hopefully, will be counteracted by this blue over here. That's essentially to say that because of the um, projected decline in the baseline mortality rate, thanks to primarily healthcare um, access, et cetera, that is going to counteract a lot of those effects, bring down the premature death. And the net change are shown over here, and also the result I showed you on the previous slide. So this is really the end of my first example. Let me pause and ask any question about this one. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, what makes you, uh, what made you choose this health outcome uh, mortality rate? Yeah. As opposed to say quality of life or uh, uh, rate of uh, sickness or, you know, yes. like, burden on the yes. healthcare system. Yes, we did quality of life. We also did DALI in this in the supplemental information. The key thing is that projecting the future life uh, lifetime of people becomes tricky um, because you know you need to. I can talk forever about this. One of the challenge and one of the caveat here is that this there are people doing the energy system modeling part. They're doing people doing exogenous demographic modeling for the future. And these two has to be, there are endogenous interactions between these two, right? If you have high pollution today, people will die early. As a result, you should have a different population projection and different baseline risk because of that. And we don't really consider that here. It's pretty much exogenous energy modeling, exogenous social demographic modeling. So one point we were really making in this paper in the end is really to say, we really need to demographers <laughs> to work more closely with regional air quality and also energy system modeler so, so that we can really start to capture those more endogenous demographic changes. That would be crucial if you want to have a more accurate estimate of DALI or years of life loss or even premature death. So it's a, it's a long answer to say we didn't do it, but we, we kind of see this as an as a emerging frontier for two fields to work together. Any other questions? OK. So if you're just looking at the previous scenario, everything seems so clean, right? I sent, I showed you a couple scenario from the global IM, and I'm sure that you'll start to asking, okay, is that five scenarios uh, going to be representative of the possible future we'll have? The short answer is, of course not. And that really brings us to thinking about the second question, how those conclusions will potentially change once we start to thinking about the future uncertainties. So, um, just to really reiterate the motivation a little bit more, in the previous study, remember that we, we find the pollution exposure will go down. Um, and that's pretty much highlighted that there will be a health benefit from displacing fossil fuels. But at the same time, once we start thinking about that net zero world, a world we can only use our imagination to think about, we need to start to also pay attention to those emerging health risks from our mitigation response. So for example, people have found that if we use a lot of bioenergy to tackle the climate problem, that may disrupt land use patterns and that may like even increase the food price and intensify food insecurity, and there may be dietary health damages associated with that. And this is also where the future uncertainty is going to play an important role because it's not all, it's not really about do we know for sure that will happen. It's more about what kind of uncertain, under what kind of possible future we may see those kind of dynam dynamic and trade-offs start to occur. So this is really the other important work that we have been thinking about in cooperating future uncertainties. And this is led by my other PhD students. Clearly likes ice cream, <laughs> Xin Yun Huang. Um, and these papers published on the sustainability earlier this year as well. Okay, what did we do? So we start with the global IAM. Here, the, the model we use is called GCAM. It's the Global Change Analysis Model. It's one of the models that IPCC, and also the National Climate Assessment has been using to build out the energy scenarios. So we, uh, constructed an exploratory ensemble where we consider one decision lever, a very simple one, do you have carbon price or not? But on top of that, we overlay a wide range of technology and socioeconomic assumptions, uncertainties that people have found to be crucial for mitigation. And for example, the, for the socioeconomics, we have five SSPs we discussed earlier. For the energy demand, we have high, median, low. Um, for fossil fuel costs and low emission costs, we also have a low, median, high. 
So combining those decision lever, whether or not you have it or not, it's a binary, with the other kind of uncertainties, we end up with a large scale scenario ensemble of 28,000, more than 28,000 scenarios. Okay. And once we have that, those like scenario ensemble, the rest of the assessment is very similar from the previous one, where we try to get the emission from the GCAN model, and then we try to capture the climate, the health, and also some of the regional distributional questions. But as you could imagine, now we have nearly 30,000 scenarios. There's no way I can convince my um, GFDL colleagues to say that, hey, run your Earth, Earth system model um, for 30,000 times. So because of that, in this project, we use a reduced form air quality model um, and also a reduced form climate model to get the, the climate and health outcomes. I can talk more about this um, trade-off between complexity and simplicity, um, but just to let you know, in this project, we use reduced reduce form air quality and reduced form um, climate model. Just to highlight the potential pathways that will lead to different health outcomes. So this is the outcome that people mainly talk about. And I actually worked on this for 10 years before I started thinking about this work. So if you have carbon pricing as a proxy for climate action, this is going to reduce your fossil fuel consumption. As a result, you reduce your air pollution emission. This is the main pathway, how you can get health co-benefits. However, it could also have pathways for co-harm. If you have carbon pricing, that increase the bioenergy use. This may not only directly increase the air pollution emissions because you're now burning biomass, but also it may have indirect effect on your land use as a result leading to like, like really unclear changes in your air pollution emissions from the land sector. So really the key thing we hope to discuss this, discover in this analysis is that competing path to competing pathways for health co-benefits and co-harm. And more importantly, under what uncertain futures, we may see that co-harm pathways to occur, okay? What do we find? So the first thing we find is that, yes, we did find consistent health co-benefits in most countries. Looking at this, I, this is what I show you um, for 2050. All those blue-ish colors are the regions where we find consistent health co-benefits. Blue regions without the hash are the regions where we find consistent health co-benefits. Across the 30,000 scenario, we always find that if you impose carbon price, it reduces fossil fuel, and that's going to improve your health outcome. Uh, and here we use the PM2.5 attributable death rate. It's normalized by population already. However, we did find our evidence for potential unintended consequences in some regions under some scenarios. And those are the regions where we show you this like hashed bar over there. This is to say that among those 30,000 scenario, there's a small subset of the scenario where we actually find increasing PM2.5 attributable death rate. Essentially to say that, hey, you, you have global mitigation, but there are some conditions where we can potentially see uh, the house risk going up. Then the question becomes why and under what precisely what are those conditions? So this is how models can be useful. What we find in short is that the pathways for house co-harms, it's really complex. It involves complex interactions between sectors and regions. Here, let me give you a quick roadmap of that complexity. Okay. So first of all, if we increase, if we impose a carbon price, what we're going to see is that across all the countries, we're going to reduce the share of coal. That's awesome. But at the same time, we're going to increase the share of renewables and also biomass because those are lower carbon resources. And as a result, we're going to see changes in precursor air pollution emissions because different sectors and activities leads to different precursor emissions. So we did find really consistent SO2 reduction across all the countries because that's what you get if you shift away from coal. But we do see in particular, the organic carbon emissions can increase in some countries, especially Russia and Canada. And that was mainly because there is, once you start to use more bioenergy, it has a lot to do with, does it really intensify your land competition? And for some places, we find the model is going to let those areas deforest more as, as in order to make the space for the new bioenergy development. 
And burning down forest is the feeding mechanism here that leads to increased organic carbon emissions. And then the rest of the results is really about how those precursor emissions lead to ambient PM 2.5 concentration and leads to changes in PM 2.5 attributable death rate. So you can see that, for example, in Canada, Russia, USA, um, you are going to see, it's very small, but you can see the small subset of your scenarios um, that will have the increased ambient PM 2.5 concentration. So looking at these results, I have to say a lot of them has, has something to do with your model assumptions, right? So is it really the case that your bioenergy is going to intensify your land competition? And if that's the case, are you really going to deforest in order to make the space for bioenergy? So we did a very step-by-step uh, um, -step model diagnostic analysis in order to understand all of this could potentially happen, but is there a assumption that is most important in determining the potential health cohorts? This is what we find. We find the most important assumption is your deforestation approach. So this is the same figure as the previous, the, 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 um, the last one, the changes in PM2.5 attributable death. And this is where you can see that, you know, um, uh, and, and this is, yeah. And here you can see that, yes, in like that Canada, we do see um, in, in some scenario, there's increase in your attributable death rate. And this is partly because in the model, the default assumption is that we're still going to use open burning to burn down those forests. But that doesn't need to be the truth because these days clear cutting has become a more popular approach for deforestation in many countries. So if you move away from open burning but start to do clear cutting, see the changes over there. So you can see that in those regions where we have some cohorts, now those cohorts are eliminated because we are making a different assumption for your deforestation approach, now using clear cutting as a result avoiding those increase in organic carbon emissions as a result um, eliminating those potential cohorts. So this is how we have been using models and especially exploratory modeling, which large scale scenario ensemble to understand what are the potential determinants for cohorts and also what are the concrete levers? In this case, just change your deforestation approach to avoid those potential co-harms in the future. Let me pause again and ask any questions for this project. Yes, oh, I see two, maybe you first. Yeah, uh, I'm just wondering, beyond the deforestation as a possible uh, the, uh, to the increase in PM 2.5 emissions, yes. how we consider indoor air source of air pollution? Like cook stoves, fireplaces? Great question. My group haven't done much work for the indoor air pollution, and we just started to work with indoor air pollution modelers to think about that question. So I think that's crucial. And that's also like very important because we spend more time indoors. So that's really the one of the key determinants for our exposure ultimately. Great question. We haven't done much. Yes. Yeah, so since it's an integrated model, yes. um, I assume that this you have your switch your carbon tax, which leads to a switch towards biomass, yes. which leads to deforestation, which has a climate effect in itself. Is yes. that all taken into account? It is. Um, great question. Remember I said we use reduced from air quality model? The only thing we consider in the study is that if you have black carbon, then you have positive radiative forcing. Those kind of simple things are there. But it's more complicated than that, right? If you have BC, if you have OC, then it's going to change your cloud formation and wind transport and precipitation in a very different way, comparing with the, those like cooling aerosols. Those, if not considered in the reduced form climate model, it just goes beyond the capability of a reduced model to capture. But we do have a project that work with the climate model, try to capture that better. But what about the simple just CO2 emissions from deforestation? Those take into account? That's there. Yeah. So it's basically increasing the CO2 emission from both land sources and energy sources and go into that carbon cycle uh, part of the model. So that part is there. Yes. I'm very interested in the uh, massive bioenergy use to cause yes. the indirect land use change. Yes. I know there are like many models to model the indirect land use change. Yes. But the values for like each of the biomass are very, very significant. Exactly. So for your model, are you doing your own assumptions or you sort of harmonize this bad? This is a great question. So this is where I think uh, some of my uh, next example would be useful because if you really think about biomass, doing it at the regional scale, it's not very useful 
right? Because if you're really thinking about the United States, as an example, we should really do it at the state level, at least, or even county level, because the biomass availability at the suitable crop varies so much. So in short, in this project, in my, in my view, we need to walk before we run. This is the project that we walk. So essentially, we're just treating United States as one region, and we did have aggregated land time so that there will be different supply curve for different kinds of bio crops, but we stopped there. But we do have, actually not me, but the model GCAM, the, they have a state level version, GCAM USA, and they're wor working with the Oak Ridge National Lab, where we now, I think the model is probably ready now, I saw the paper coming out, where, we in, where they incorporated state level representation of biomass supply. It precisely to tackle the question you were asking just now. Yeah. Because of time, I want to move on to my last example, but I'm happy to have more discussions later on. Okay, this is a natural transition because everything I showed you just now in the example one and two is at the regional scale, but ultimately nobody really cares about the average exposure level for the United States. It's really about this like final resolution exposure disparities and even health disparities that are really like shaping the discourse of today's policy discussion. So, so in this third example I wanna talk about, this is the last mature one. So take the results with a grain of salt. Um, we tried to thinking about the effects of domestic and global decarbonization, and then looking at the, the changes on the exposure disparities across the United States. So I hope by now you're familiar with how I'm going to talk on my work. It's all through, start with the diagram, because that's how models work. So if you're thinking about your endpoint, which is I care about exposure disparities, put it in a very high level way, it's really a correlation of two things. One is where the pollution is high, and the other is where the disadvantaged community populations live. Then how these two things might evolve in the future. So first of all, if you're thinking about where the pollution is high, both global and domestic decarbonization effort would change that pattern because for the domestic decarbonization, we're going to change the future emissions pattern. If we shift away from coal, if we start to cite biomass power plants instead of like coal power plants, we start to see different emission patterns within the country. But also global decarbonization effort would also matter because if we end up in a cl like climate, um, a warmer future, this is going to change the temperature, the um, precipitation, the wind pattern, et cetera. All those are going to change the formation and the deposition of your air pollution in the air. On top of that, this question, where the disadvantaged population live, is, has also something to do with what will be the future fine scale social economic trend, like urbanization, migration, and also what will be the future race and income patterns in that broader context. So uh, for us, there's no way we can make a good projection for them, but we should we really, we're using this project, we try to demonstrate what are the, those important linkages over there and how those linkages collectively shape the potential exposure disparity in the future. And this work is led by my postdoc, Tong Fei Wan, and the paper is still in the making. So, um, what we try, so this is our model map method, and what we really try to do here is to have a multi scale modeling approach. So, for the global um, decarbonization efforts, we consider an emissions action where we try to just use the present day meteorological conditions. We also have a limited action case where we end up with a much warmer future. And then using the CSM model, which is a global climate model, we get the meteorological conditions for the United States for mid-century. And they vary because you have different de global decarbonization efforts that drives the temperature and the climate future. For the domestic climate efforts, we start with a reference case, which is a visit as usual, just consider the existing policy, but not additional stuff. And then we consider a net zero by 2050 case, which is the policy target. Um, that this country is hoping to achieve. Then we use a state level integrated assessment model, GCAP USA, to get the state level emissions. Then we use the national emission inventory um, from the EPA to downscale that state level emissions to good emissions at 12 by 12 kilometer resolution. And this meteorological condition and the good emissions are going to drive a regional air quality model worth CAM so that we can simulate the future MBF PM 2.5 and ozone concentrations at hourly scale and at 12 by 12 kilometer resolution. 
On top of that, we also want to make sure that the county level socioeconomic, that social demographic pattern are consistent with the socioeconomic drivers that we have been using to drive those energy integrated system models in the, in the first place. So that's why I added a um, added an arrow over here. And once we have that simulated pollution concentration and the county level socioeconomic demographic, we can start to thinking about the exposure disparities. Okay, so this is the modeling framework we, we put together. Then the question is what we find. I have to say, um, I have a love and hate relationship with this project because as a researcher, I was hoping to get some like concrete conclusion. Like if you decarbonize, this is good for equity, but no. We, what we find is much more complex for that. So that's why I call them preliminary insight because even within the team, we are still trying to figure out what exactly did we find? What are the concrete things we can say? So just quickly summarize what we already find. We find that domestic decarbonization efforts can lower future pollution level. Here's one example. This is annual mean PM 2.5, annual mean ozone. If you're just looking at the level, you can see that over time, it's going to decrease shifting to the left. Um, in sense, and, and the ref, if you go for net zero, it's going to be lower than the reference. So far, so good. It is the equity assessment that makes the picture very complex. So first of all, it's kind of just from the results here, we did find that the current exposure disparity may persist into the future. So if you're looking, what I, so what I show you here is the um, solid and the halo dots, and they show the median household income for the lowest dicel and highest dicel. So essentially this says that the high income, this way, low income group right now have higher pollution level, and we do see them remain on the right side in the future. That's what we meant by annual mean PM 2.5, like at least for the, this PM 2.5 exposure disparity, it may persist. Same thing for the ozone, but with the flip side, and this is also uh, some what some other people already find the ozone concentration the high income group may have made a higher ozone concentration and that may persist in the future as well um that's the income results and you start once we started looking at the race results we really didn't really find significant well i should use that word substantial enough result disparity between them and what to make it worse we also find that once you start to thinking about the global decarbonization effort, so you use RPC 8.5, a warmer future to drive your pollution modeling, you're going to see the results start to look very different, especially in this case, this case, and this case. So in other words, we did find evidence that once you started thinking about the climate future as a result of global decarbonization future, I mean, to glo global uh, start thinking about know, the future meteorological conditions, they may have potentially large impacts on exposure disparities. So and to make it even worse, we actually, we did a lot of sensitivity analysis on this. And I'm not going to show you, I'm not going to bore you with all of those, but we did find there's so much complex relationship and so much uncertainty that would make your equity as conclusion about the equity assessment even flip under some conditions. And here are some of the major ones. First of all, thinking about the emissions pathway, where will be the future emission hotspots? Today, the emission hotspots are where we have coal facilities in general. But in the future, in the net zero future, all the coal facilities will go away. As a result, like we should really be thinking about what are the new technologies we're using and where they sit in this country. About the meteorology, this is really hard. Like, how can we model fine scale pattern for future wind, boundary layer high rainfall, and also wildfire? In this study, we keep the wildfire emissions at the present level because I have talked forever about that. It's very hard to model fire emissions as an atmospheric scientist. Um, if you're thinking about the social economics, migration and economic development, those things will really change where people live and what's the correlation with the high pollution level. And finally, this is something I find so troubling. Sometimes we even find that if you change the spatial scale of your exposure disparity assessment, county level versus census tract level versus neighborhood level, even if your input data is the same, you may end up having different equity assessment. So that's why I think this is probably the only thing we can say for now, which is methodologically, we find that model choice and assumptions matter a lot for our equity assessment. And with that, 
I want to end by just two overarching findings of my group. One is that we really need human-centered decarbonization technology and decarbonization strategies. Technologies are cool, but ultimately we care more about people. Second is that and our models need to get real about people. With that, this is a picture of my group. Some of their new members' names are here. And thank you so much for your attention. Uh, uh, I think due to the interest of time, we have we have two very very quick questions. I know that all the students have many questions, so it's now is the good time to ask. Kind of like a big conceptualized question about the model, as you mentioned, it depends heavily on the assumption yeah. and a lot of things. So I'm thinking about the famous saying, all the models are useful, but they're wrong. So uh, in your model, how do you prioritize assumptions or the parameters that you choose to build your model? Yeah, like? that's a great question. So I consider model as a hypothesis testing tool. I don't consider model as a predictive model. So the way I say hypothesis testing tool is that I think from the empirical research, epidemiology research as an example, we already developed some sense or hypothesis about what might, might matter, right? Like aging would matter, pollution scale and pollution pattern would matter. And then I think about model as hypothesis testing tool. So we know from the past, these factors are going to be important. Can we use model as a way to test under what conditions this factor would be important to really shape the outcome we care about? So I think that's a long way to say like, um, in, in our world, we start with the hypothesis and then try to view the model so that will that will equip us with the capability to test that hypothesis. I think that's a much better way to use model, especially because of the deep uncertainty of the future. Yes. When you are creating model relationships, for example, yeah. between land use and food, how at what scale do you think when you are building those things? Like yeah. Great question. Take some aggregate. So um, practically, a lot of modelers are constrained by data, as you could imagine, right? So that's why a lot of the model are global model, and they have they just focus on the regional scale. Um, but I really think, just go back to that question, I think it has a lot to do with your question as well. So that's why for some of the questions, I actually think the global IM is not the right tool. So you have to go for a finer scale model in order to do that. And maybe in those circumstances, that system interaction, remember I showed you the system of system, some of the system interactions might not be that important. As a result, you can build your model just capturing the core things you are you, you think is important. And then put the other thing as exogenous assumptions or the boundary or initial conditions. So that's, again, I think the general thought, like my group has been, the guiding principle we have is start with the question and then thinking about what are the main mechanisms of certain that would matter and view the model from there. Wonderful, thank you. I'm going to just quick announcement so we have the food here so everyone can take the sandwich. And for students, someone who's speaking is a uh, speaker, we have the group have a lot of speaker. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>